professor of uh, philosophy at the University of North Texas, and uh, I have been engaged in environmental philosophy for the past 40 years. The environmental crisis was one of uh, three socially gripping phenomena in the 1960s. The other two were the Southern Civil Rights Movement and uh, the anti-war movement of the U.S. involvement in uh, Vietnam. Um, the, I, was involved, I was living, born and raised in Memphis, Tennessee and had returned to Memphis for my first academic job uh, just at the moment that the civil rights movement was reaching a critical uh, juncture in its history. Uh, the university that I was working with, uh, the University of Memphis now uh, called, uh, was until about 1960 legally segregated. And so by the time I joined the faculty in 1966, uh, there were no African-American faculty members and only a handful of African-American students. And so those students wanted to form a student organization for which they needed a faculty sponsor. And I found myself uh, recruited to be the um, faculty representative of the Black Students Association. Um, and so with this association, with my involvement there, I was coordinating uh, campus uh, activities um, during the sanitation workers strike which brought Martin Luther King to Memphis for what proved to be his last uh, campaign. And so um, after the assassination of Martin Luther King in 1968, I was there during those events, um, I began to think about uh, how the other uh, phenomena of the 1960s, the civil rights movement, the, the uh, anti-war movement, and the uh, environmental crisis might be uh, connected. And it occurred to me that the philosophical foundations for the civil rights movement had been really developed in the 18th century. And Martin Luther King was only calling the United States to live up to its stated ideals. So I had rather little to contribute as a philosopher to civil rights, but it occurred to me that our ethical relationship to the natural environment to, uh, had not been really, um, had not been uh, thought about uh, by uh, philosophers. And so this was an opportunity for me to, to extend the idea of social responsibility, perhaps even moral regard for the natural uh, world, for the environment, um, uh, making the, the, the connection from civil rights to, to concern for the environment. And so I then, then began to think uh, about the possibility of an ecological philosophy, an environmental ethic, and um, ideas of that sort began to occur to me in the late 1960s uh, with this transition from uh, civil rights to uh, environmental uh, uh, consciousness uh, in, in my case. As a result of my involvement in the events that led to the assassination of Martin Luther King. I lost my job uh, at the university and uh, took a job in Wisconsin, um, which turned out to be uh, the nascent, the epicenter of the nascent environmental movement. It was only uh, 
hundred kilometers from the homestead of uh, John Muir when he came from Scotland to the U.S. and from the um, shack of Aldo Leopold which he celebrated in a sand county almanac. At that point I'd never heard of Aldo Leopold and only had the vaguest idea of uh, John Muir. Uh, but in 1970 these um, these moments coalesced into a sort of critical mass with the first Earth Day, which was a very, very big event on my campus in uh, Wisconsin because it had been sponsored by um, Gaylord Nelson, who was uh, one of the members of Congress who inaugurated Earth Day. and. Uh, the specialty of the university was natural resources, forestry, fisheries, and that sort of thing. And so there was a, already an environmental consciousness there which just exploded uh, in the 1970s, or in 1970. And so we, some faculty members, interested faculty members, got together and thought, well, we need an environmental studies program here to sort of bring into a more formal academic setting the concerns that were taking place around us. And so I volunteered to teach a course called Environmental Ethics. I had no idea uh, where I would uh, begin or what texts I would use. And at that point, a student in another course of mine, Ancient Philosophy, handed me his copy of a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold and said, here, this might be of use to you. And as it turned out, it was, um, we say in English, just what the doctor ordered, just and has been the core of my teaching and uh, research interests um, uh, ever after. Part of the uh, concern, of course, is the obvious one. The, what is driving me is that uh, we do, in fact, have an ever uh, worsening environmental crisis. And uh, it seems to me that philosophers have something uh, very important to contribute to that, because I think that all of our actions in regard to the environment or anything else are shaped by the way we uh, conceptualize, the way we represent the world around us, the way we represent ourselves, and that ultimately um, it's a crisis of ideas as well as a crisis of uh, policy and uh, technology and uh, the things that are the more immediate uh, drivers of environmental uh, degradation, that uh, none of this is really going to change significantly unless we really are able to fundamentally reorient our uh, worldview, our conception of the world in which we live and of who we are and what our proper relationship with that world is. So part of it is just a, a passion that has been uh, driving uh, me throughout my life uh, uh, for uh, social responsibility and doing this in the only way that I know how, which is uh, my role as a philosopher. So that's one of the uh, certainly one of the main driving motives here where my work is concerned. But the other one is fortunately a passion for the uh, activity of philosophy uh, itself. I love my work and I take an aesthetic delight in the expression of ideas. I think of uh, philosophy as a kind of conceptual architecture and to be able to design something uh, that is uh, beautiful, uh, cogent, uh, coherent, persuasive,
uh, is is a great pleasure. Uh, so I I have there's a for me a lot of internal uh, reward there. I I would like to say in regard to uh, environmental philosophy that one of the things that attracted me to it was it 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 raised anew the oldest and the most basic uh, philosophical uh, questions. The nature of nature, human nature, and the appropriate relationship between humans and nature. The 20th century, 20th century philosophy had become very narrow, very concerned with um, uh, uh, highly arcane and technical questions with methodological uh, rigor and logical uh, precision, all of which didn't seem to me to be the kind of philosophy that uh, up until the 20th century philosophers were really engaged in. So I was wanting to do philosophy in the grand manner and even today I'm uh, increasingly uh, characterizing uh, the kind of uh, philosophical work that I do as neo-pre-Socratic philosophy because it's painting with a broad bro brush, it's engaging these, these earliest and most fundamental questions of philosophy, and that to me is also a, a driving um, uh, uh, force. One last comment about that, and that is that I'm also excited by the process of philosophy. I won't say progress of philosophy, but that science and philosophy are dynamic. And I'm always trying to be sensitive to the, uh, to the new developments that are coming. I'm listening to my early career, younger colleagues, and the kinds of and, and the kinds of criticisms that they make of what we have been doing uh, in the uh, early stages of environmental philosophy and where it's going uh, now. I think that many philosophers uh, have a formative period, they decide what their position is, and then they dig in their heels and defend the uh, position that they've assumed uh, as I sometimes like to put it, uh, there is no sophistry to which they will not stoop uh, in order to uh, uh, defend uh, this uh, ossified uh, uh, stance that they've taken. But I'm always willing to say, well, that's what I thought last year, uh, now uh, in the light of the uh, discussions that are going on, critical discussions. I'm. Uh, wanting to or looking for adjustment, change, development, moving uh, forward in my thinking. And so that's also exciting that, that, that there's always a, a frontier that uh, of, uh, a sort of conceptual advance that uh, to me is important to keep up with to contribute to, to be a part of an ongoing conversation. All right, first of all, uh, let me uh, take this opportunity to uh, clarify um, something that I think is sort of hovering in the background here. Um, I do think that uh, there is a dying tradition in the United States, perhaps also here in France, of the public intellectual, the engaged philosopher, um, though it, in my opinion it's very important to sort of maintain that tradition. So I like to regard myself as in the tradition of an engaged, socially engaged um, intellectual involved in uh, the important um, 
questions that face our, our civilization uh, today. Um, so that leads then to the, the uh, relationship between the intellectual and the activist community. And this gives me an opportunity, I think, to, to indicate another important aspect of my transition from the civil rights engagement to the engagement in the environmental movement. Um, in the, my involvement in the Southern Civil Rights Movement was, how shall I say, sort of as a soldier in the, in the ranks of Martin Luther King's campaign. Um, I was on the streets uh, carrying signs. I was in meetings organizing, uh, helping to organize demonstrations and that sort of thing. I was fully engaged as an activist. But one of the things that occurred to me after the, 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 the reflections that I, I engaged in, after the, I, I saw what sort of personal impact that had on me, uh, disrupting my career, uh, uh, virtually I was in exile from my hometown in Memphis, Tennessee, because my engagement in this activist tradition uh, did not sit well with the very conservative administration of the university I worked for, and I, uh, I lost my job. I had to move to a very unfamiliar place, um, and so on. And I was thinking, well, th these activities are not engaging me in in the in terms of the of the talents that I actually have and it was not really a philosophical an intellectual activity it was just a uh, anyone could have been doing who had similar motivations that I did uh, to to be doing the activities that I was doing in the civil rights movement so I wanted to be able to do something uh, that was uh, socially engaged, but that also called on certain special skills and talents and training uh, that I had acquired and that I could contribute. And that was a major transition in, the, in my transition from the civil rights movement to the environmental movement, because there I could I could be an activist through f my philosophy. So I, I, I should say here that I'm not a member of a, the Green Party. Uh, I'm not sure that one exists in the United States. Uh, I am a member of various small conservation uh, organizations, but I'm not engaged in street demonstrations or other um, uh, traditional activist uh, activities. Um, in some ways, my epistemological modesty is such that, that I don't feel comfortable with ideological commitments. I will always want to maintain some possibility of uh, error uh, uh, that uh, ideologies are too rigid, in a sense, I think, to, for, for a philosopher to be uh, comfortable with uh, epistemologically uh, speaking. So my activism is completely um, coincident with my work as a philosopher and what I like to what what I think of myself as a public intellectual is not so much to to speak in public forums it's really just doing academic work and academic publication but writing and expressing myself in a way that's inspiring that is accessible to a
a larger literate community and the purpose of this work as as I have discovered it to be is both to inspire and to provide a kind of um, vocabulary by means of which people who are in who are activists and committed to various causes are able to give voice to and give articulation to some of their deeper uh, but inchoate um, values. And so, for example, just to take a, 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 a specific example, the whole academic discussion in environmental philosophy about intrinsic value versus instrumental value has been extremely useful in the community of conservation biology and people who are, are, um, are working for saving species, especially species that, that are, are not particularly uh, valuable from an instrumental, from a human use point of view, um, to, to be able to give them the kind of, shall we say, conceptual ammunition, the uh, terminological uh, uh, capacities to be able to articulate the, the sorts of values that they feel but otherwise could not express. And so I think that that's the, the kind of contribution, that's the kind of activism that I've engaged in. In fact, I've written a couple of papers uh, saying that environmental philosophy is environmental activism the most radical and effective kind because it's changing the cognitive landscape and it is providing a vocabulary by means of which people can express their, their values in a clear and persuasive way. I think that the, in retrospect, the seminal text for the motivation for environmental philosophy, the seminal text for the substance of environmental philosophy, many people would agree, and certainly I would, would be Aldo Leopold's A Sand County Almanac, and especially the capstone essay, the denouement of that book, The Land Ethic. But the, the motivation and the mandate for the emergence of environmental philosophy was an essay by a medieval historian of technology, Lynn White Jr., called The um, Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. And in that particular essay, uh, beginning with the idea of modern technology and modern science, um, uh, Lynn White Jr. traced the origins of science and modern technology to the, to the West uh, at a moment in which Western culture and civilization was totally dominated by the Judeo-Christian worldview. Then following that lead, he traces the, uh, the, the environmental crisis, the historical roots of the environmental crisis back to the uh, really just a few verses in Genesis that humans are created in the image of God, given dominion over the earth and uh, charged to uh, subdue it, uh, a kind of unnumbered and first and original commandment, subdue the earth. Um, but that was the sort of cavalier and lurid text of that essay. The subtext of the essay was a repeated refrain. What we do about our ecology, our environment, depends upon what we think. And in order to change what we do, we have to change the way we think. And the, the whose business is it to concern themselves with what we think and with changing the way we think, except philosophers. And so this seemed to be a kind of
call to philosophers to rethink the nature of nature, human nature, and the uh, relationship between the two. So that really is environmental philosophy. It is, it's metaphysical. Uh, it has to do with a, a philosophy of nature. It's what Kant would call um, moral anthropology or philosophical anthropology, human nature. And then the ethics aspect of it is then in the relationship between the appropriate relationship between humans and nature. So environmental philosophy is in a sense the, the larger whole involving metaphysics, the uh, philosophy of ecology, a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of philosophical anthropology, and then also ethics as a sort of subset of this larger, uh, larger field. Uh, environmental philosophy, however, in its inceptions, not only on my part, but many of the other writers in the field at, at the very beginning, really focused on environmental ethics, the ethics um, aspect of it. And in some ways, it was in a dialectical relationship with the advent of animal liberation, which came along at just about the same time. Peter Singer's book, um, Animal Liberation, uh, was also uh, uh, came along in the, in the mid-1970s at the same time that environmental philosophy did. So there was a sort of... Um, dialectical relationship there, where Singer was basing his animal ethic on the idea of extending ethics to a wider community uh, based on the criterion of sentience. And so here we begin with some classical ethical theory, in this case utilitarianism, uh, pointing out that uh, if pleasure and pain is what is good and bad respectively, it's not only human beings who experience pleasure and pain, but other animals, so we should uh, consider their interests perhaps equally with our own because they are fellow uh, sentient beings. Uh, Tom Reagan countered with the idea of animal rights because Kantianism and utilitarianism have always been uh, to some extent at odds with one another and that, that he developed the Kantian tradition in a similar sort of extended way. Uh, and then the next phase was, well, can we extend this to plants uh, uh, on the basis of the fact that they could plausibly be said to have interests and so on. So there was this whole conversation uh, going on, really building towards an environmental ethic, uh, sort of taking the next step beyond animal ethics. Well, me for my part said, well, no, this is really missing the point, that environmental ethics is not about what I sometimes disparagingly call, it's not about uh, uh, grubs, bugs, and shrubs, uh, the individual uh, uh, interests of uh, non-human beings. It's about uh, species uh, uh, continuing and the concern about species existence, about ecological degradation and so on. None of it's not captured with these other um, uh, these, these approaches to environmental ethics sort of building on, on traditional uh, moral philosophy, Kantianism, utilitarianism, extended first to animals, then to plants, and so on. It's we, we need a more holistic uh, ethic, and that is exactly what was explored uh, by Aldo Leopold uh, in the land ethic. And so I then uh, made it my business early in the 
uh, development of environmental ethics to um, uh, bring forward a holistic ethic focused on uh, what you might call transorganismic um, levels of biological organization on biotic communities, on species, on ecosystems, um, and so on, and try to build a theory which would support this holistic uh, approach to uh, ethics, um, which, which we, we find a sketch of in Aldo Leopold's land ethic, but it wasn't really fully developed. So what I wanted to do was to sort of consider the land ethic as the tip of the iceberg and explore the, the um, conceptual foundations beneath the surface, so to speak, uh, that uh, one could uh, uh, one could intuit there and then develop more specifically. Well, in short, Leopold uh, hints that um, we might look to Darwin's biological theory of the origin and nature of ethics as a um, uh, as 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 the sort of uh, tradition of ethical thinking that he was drawing on, and Darwin in turn uh, is looking to Hume, David Hume and his foundation. So, so from Leopold to Darwin and then eventually to Hume, and then we find a kind of locus in the history of philosophy for the development of the theoretical foundations of a more holistic um, uh, approach to environmental ethics. And so that's been the uh, trajectory of my uh, work uh, in, in the ethical uh, aspect of environmental uh, philosophy. I think that there were two, what I think of as two waves of the environmental crisis where public awareness is concerned. The first one was in the 1960s and the environmental concerns were local and regional. We had uh, oil spills off the coast of uh, Spain, off the coast of Santa Barbara. Uh, there was uh, grossly polluted air over our cities, especially uh, Los Angeles and uh, Houston. Uh, Madrid was, uh, uh, you could hardly see across the street, I remember uh, visiting in 1980. Uh, and uh, waterways were grossly polluted with municipal sewage and, and uh, industrial waste. Uh, Famously in Cleveland, Ohio, the Cuyahoga River caught fire. Uh, and so uh, these were the kinds of things that suddenly uh, alerted people to uh, uh, an environmental crisis. Rachel Carson had described uh, uh, carcinogenic uh, pesticides, but again, uh, having a local impact in agricultural areas and urban areas and so on. The second wave of the environmental crisis occurred in the mid-1980s. In fact, you could almost date it to 1988. Um, the, at, at, in the 80s, we came into a consciousness that um, species extinction was a global phenomenon resulting in possibly the sixth great mass extinction uh, that the earth has experienced. The hole in the ozone uh, was uh, discovered and 1988 was especially in the northern hemisphere, probably here in Europe but certainly in the United States, one of the most palpably hot uh, and dry seasons, and that's when um, Yellowstone National Park uh, caught on fire uh, and burned. It became a, a uh, something seared into 
uh, the um, uh, uh, consciousness, and at that point, global warming and global climate change came to the vivid attention um, of the public. Um, the first philosopher to really respond to the globality of the environmental crisis was Michel Serre, uh, actually with his uh, work uh, Le Contrat uh, Naturel. In the United States, Dale Jameson was also beginning to think about uh, these things. And the all, so it, it, in my opinion, what this does is to really call environmental philosophy and especially environmental ethics back to the starting point that the sorts of theories that we had worked out uh, in the 20th century between 1975 say and the end of the century were really scaled to these more local and regional concerns, biotic communities, ecosystems, uh, landscapes were the, um, were the focus of ethical concern, especially uh, the land ethic uh, in which I had invested so much of my intellectual uh, capital uh, suddenly appeared to be um, not, not capable of addressing the new uh, uh, environmental crisis, the second wave of the environmental crisis, which was uh, probably best, uh, uh, its signature really is global climate change. Um, it, and I don't think that the uh, land ethic can simply be scaled up. It really requires a kind of complete rethinking of um, uh, the uh, uh, environment. And indeed, it calls on us to become acquainted with other sciences. Environmental philosophy had been informed by ecology. Uh, now it's global biogeochemistry, earth system sciences uh, are the uh, sciences that we have to be informed about in order to be able to address these uh, questions in an uh, ethical uh, way. Um, what that really brings to the fore also in terms of ethics is the Gaia narrative because in some ways the Gaia hypothesis personalizes the earth. It gives the earth in a metaphorical sense of face, um, and it uh, focuses our attention on the earth as a whole functioning, self-regulating uh, kind of system to which we might begin to conceive uh, or reconceive a sense of duty or obligation. But as I've thought through, the uh, uh, moral challenge of global climate change, uh, while the Gaia narrative and a sense of responsibility to, to the earth uh, as a whole uh, is, you know, it, it really doesn't bear close scrutiny because the planet Earth in its biography has survived for 3.5 billion years and we really are powerless to affect it negatively one way or the other. Some of my colleagues have um, been very um, hyperbolic in saying that uh, uh, we are uh, killing the planet or that uh, the the earth because of global warming uh, is fevered and sick and uh, so on. I think it uh, does not bear uh, close scrutiny. Uh, the earth is, uh, as I think you put it yourself uh, yesterday, uh, indifferent. Uh, 
and it's uh, not. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it it it's not only indifferent to us, but it's indifferent to what we might be doing to the earth. All we can do is to simply change certain uh, set points of equilibria, and the earth will become. Uh, it will uh, uh, p p possibly. Uh, uh, ratchet up into a different uh, uh, sort of uh, climate regime. Um, so, but if that happens, we may find ourselves not really adapted to the conditions that we're driving the planet to. So the risk is not to Gaia, is not to the Earth itself. The risk is to us. But who is us? Well, I don't think that the species is really at risk. That is to say, people will probably survive and uh, no matter uh, uh, how much conditions may uh, change uh, in terms of climate and, and uh, sea levels and the shape of continents and weather and that sort of thing. Uh, but what is, I think, at risk is our very fragile, very complex, very brittle, uh, uh, very overconnected uh, global uh, economic uh, and uh, social uh, fabric, uh, civilization as we know it, the world that we know uh, both climatically speaking and culturally, socially, economically speaking is what is threatened, I think, by climate change. And so while my whole career or whole um, uh, philosophical history here has been as, as someone who has advocated the intrinsic value of non-human natural entities, nature as a whole, depending on how that's sorted out, uh, on a non-anthropocentric ethic, uh, which all, all I think is still quite viable uh, uh, at the appropriate scale, I think where the global scale is concerned, that the appropriate environmental ethic has to be anthropocentric. We have to, we have to be concerned about preserving the world as we know it for ourselves, for immediate posterity, and for uh, future generations. Uh, otherwise, I think we're uh, at grave risk of a kind of collapse of that world uh, as, as we know it, which would have horrific um, uh, consequences in terms of human uh, suffering. So um, I'm sort of working at uh, along these lines. Now, uh, the problem, I think, is, as we all know, is that the, the temporal scale of change itself has so far been so gradual that it's hardly been perceptible. And therefore, it's difficult to convince people that there is an imminent problem and an imminent uh, threat and then further there is a certain uh, temporal scale of moral concern. We're concerned about the world as it, we wake up to tomorrow. We're concerned about the world that we will live in in the future. We're concerned about the world that our children and their children and perhaps their children will live in because we have a connection with, with these people. But how far can our concern extend over centuries, over millennia? Do we really have any obligations to distant future generations that are in any sense palpable and actionable uh, today? I think that that is that, in other words, global climate change sort of, it, it's pushing the limits of the temporal horizons 
a moral engagement, uh, basically. And that, to me, presents a, 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 a real problem, one that may not really be possible for us to solve in any, in, in any uh, effective way. Uh, so uh, these, this, this is the, uh, this is really the philosophical and the ethical uh, challenge of the uh, 21st century, and to sort of bring the conversation back to the beginning, and that is uh, uh, the, the 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 direction that philosophy itself will take. Uh, from its aberration, I think, in the 20th century to these to analytic philosophy in the Anglo-American tradition, phenomenology in the in the continental tradition, these sort of very arcane and isolated concerns. I think that the challenge of the 21st century is going to be presented by globality and that while environmental philosophy is not the only sort of anticipation of this, the harbinger of it, that future, the, the, the nature of, of the discipline of philosophy in the 20th century is going to be one that is uh, interdisciplinary, it's going to have to take into account the contribution of the sciences, to these problems of globality uh, that we are collectively facing. So I see environmental philosophy uh, as being a touchstone for the transformation of philosophy as it, as it transitions from the 20th century uh, to the 21st century. Not all philosophy is going to be environmental philosophy, but like environmental philosophy, it will be socially engaged, it will be looking outward intellectually rather than inward, and it will be, be uh, meeting the challenges of uh, the, the, the global world, politically, uh, socially, environmentally. I was uh, indeed uh, at the um, Rio 1992 meetings. Uh, we're coming up on the 20th anniversary. There'll be a meeting this year. Uh, there was a great deal of optimism and excitement, and even drama uh, at Rio 92. It was the Earth Summit. It was the first moment in which heads of state from all over the world were gathering to focus on uh, the challenge of um, the environment, uh, globally, uh, locally, uh, socially. Uh, so it was tremendously uh, optimistic, and as I say, there was a bit of drama because uh, the then president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, uh, was uh, refusing to come. And then finally he arrived and everyone uh, thought that that would uh, uh, move uh, things uh, forward. Um, subsequent uh, iterations in Cairo and uh, uh, Copenhagen and so on have been, generally speaking, disappointing. Uh, and so, quite frankly, I have rather little uh, confidence that uh, anything significant is going to be coming out of uh, uh, Rio um, this year, to, uh, 20. Uh, 12. I'm convinced that change is going to come, but it's going to come in a kind of organic way, uh, grassroots in which people, 
people in in um, uh, in, in in the entrepreneurial world in the business world uh, are going to be ahead of the politicians. Cons you know, ordinary people are going to be, and that eventually governments will begin to ratify these changes, institutionalize them in terms of policy and law, and that will hopefully um, begin to address in serious ways uh, the uh, problems of global uh, climate change, both in terms of mitigation and adaptation um, with all uh, geoengineering sort of out there on the horizon as a as a, um, uh, a, a remedy of last of last resort. But um, as to the the meeting itself, probably more symbolic than substantive, uh, and uh, probably its symbolism will be. Uh, less effective than the um, uh, meeting that occurred 20 years ago, which, which did have both substantive and symbolic significance, in my opinion. Less so this time. The question is, how do I see the future uh, as being uh, short for me personally uh, <laughs> at the age of 71? Uh, I don't have much of a future, and I'm hoping that, uh, you know, I'll live out uh, my life without dramatic um, uh, change and impact. I have a son who's 45 years old, a grandson who's 14, a partner who's uh, just about turning 40, and I'm concerned about their future. Yes, so the future, uh, despite the fact that uh, my personal future is rather limited, uh, is nevertheless of... Uh, of real importance to me as it should be to uh, everyone. I am skeptical of Jeremiah predictions of uh, catastrophe. I think that change in the sense of uh, the, um, uh, the, the kinds of um, uh, transformations in the global climate are going to come gradually. We'll be, uh, it'll be death by a thousand cuts rather than some sort of uh, horrific uh, catastrophe. Uh, but I'm not, cons uh, not convinced that uh, the, any change is going to be, uh, that, that I'm, I'm not convinced that anyone can predict any scenario. Uh, as we go forward in the future. It's been my experience over my lifetime that we're always surprised by what happens, that uh, optimistic uh, predictions, pessimistic predictions, any kind of predictions always seem to, to be uh, defied by the complexity of the way the future uh, unfolds and and develops. So I'm just waiting and watching, kind of always open to um, a, a, a spectrum of possibilities and always convinced that there will be unforeseen surprises for better or for worse. Uh, and so I am uh, I describe myself as a desperate optimist. Otherwise, why get out of bed? Why do anything? I mean, you have to be optimistic that uh, your work uh, can have a positive influence. And I certainly think that it has in the past, and I continue to uh, uh, work uh, with great enthusiasm uh, and with great confidence uh, that it will make a difference and that the difference will be positive. So I'm optimistic, but not in any sense certain. There again, it's an epistemological humility. We just can't know these things, and we can only have uh, hope, and we can only be uh, engaged out of a spirit of uh, hope and optimism.